So let me talk about a couple of technologies that, that uh, uh, I, I find uh, fascinating and are related in a geospatial manner. Uh, laser scanning is, is uh, the modern day surveyor. It's a, a, a device that, that shoots out a laser beam and, and watches for the return reflection of that laser beam, traveling at the speed of light and incredible sensors that we have uh, available to us in these devices now can actually measure those nanoseconds delay and turn that into a calculation of distance to the, to the object that the, the scanner, the laser beam hit. So it returns an X, Y, Z coordinate and measures very precisely a great deal of uh, all, anything that reflects. <laughs> uh, it doesn't do well with water, but it does anything that reflects. So you take a bridge and traditionally if the surveyor there was an improvement plan for this bridge. You had to retrofit it to upgrade the, uh, the, the seismic uh, uh, code. You would traditionally have to send out your, your survey crew and they'd be jumping around, climbing around, setting points and trying to figure out this thing, you know, and they, they, they would have, probably somebody ends up in the water, you know, that you may end up ruining some equipment if it falls into the water, but, but uh, a bit of a challenge to, uh, to survey such a uh, a device. So you bring in the laser scanner, you put it in a couple places, you don't just depend upon one, you, you control a couple points and you, you, you shoot, the, shoot the, um, the structure and put it into a computer system that's able to discern the edges of, of uh, corners and things and draw lines. So you put in points into the computer system and there you have what we call a point cloud which is all the points that were returned in XYZ position in a, in a computer system that's able to look at the incredible detail that you can get out of a point cloud. All of these points are, are geo-referenced, spatially referenced. You can use them to go in, to turn into a, a solid model of your bridge. Also can be used for a, a historic uh, building preservations. You set up your, uh, your scanner and you scan the scan the bridge 5,000 points per second as it goes up and down and up and down and up and down and lo and behold you, you, you build yourself a, a nice model of of the building. It's a little dark, I apologize for that. Here's a video. Because it's geo-referenced you can actually fly through these kind of things. So we were doing a, a, a streetscape improvement project for Monterey, California. Now in processing these point clouds you, you use some algorithms to take out things you don't want. Like there were cars in that street, but we didn't. We weren't interested in the elevation of the street for this for this analysis. It was all about the sidewalk and behind the sidewalk. So we just eliminated all the points in the street. That's why it's black. And uh, likewise, parked cars and people on the sidewalks. Every once in a while, you'll see a person off in the distance that'll that'll show up. If you're ever in a room where one of these laser scanners is used as a demo, you actually see the people in their faces sitting <laughs> wherever they are whenever the scanner went across. But uh, uh, you can see the car plastered against the wall there. That's sort of an anomaly because we eliminated the points, but the, the, the uh, color of reflection was still associated with that. The model put it on the face of the wall as opposed to where the car really was. So you, you, have, you have some things that don't quite look right. You gotta understand what you're looking at. Here's a, here's a, a, a gas station on the, on the right with cars sitting in there that, that weren't eliminated. But every one of these points, I mean, this is, the surveyors like this because our surveyors get frustrated when they've spent a whole great deal of time at a site collecting information and then after they come back with all of what the engineer asked for the engineer comes down oh by the way did you pick up that one corner I really need the, uh, the, the the manhole basin that's on the sidewalk right there right so of course they have to go out and catch it again well in in the case of a point cloud you have all these points registered so in many cases the survey department can go back to the location that the engineer is asking about, show them the point cloud, and yeah, that, right there. <laughs> they pick up the point and they've already got it. So a, a great deal of time saving can come away. It's just a little dark, so looks a lot better from my point of view, sorry. <laughs> LIDAR is basically the same thing as laser scanning, but it's up in a plane in the sky. 
And what we're looking at here is, is something that got national notoriety because it, it, it brought uh, LiDAR into the limelight, but it's sort of a sad story because this is, uh, is uh, 9-17 or September 17th, six days after 9-11. And at that point in time in New York City, the ground crews and the services were going crazy trying to figure out how to get at this big hole in the ground and they had no idea. So red is deep. The more red you get, the deeper it is. The greens are higher things. So, so uh, uh, a photogrammetrist uh, flew the LiDAR plane over ground zero and made this model of what the hole looked like. It was not even visible at this point in time. There was clouds of smoke and, and whatnot, and the, la the laser was able to penetrate that. And the state of, uh, of uh, public works uh, drawings and things were, were very disparate. Every agency had their own, so they were uh, in emergency services trying to assemble all these uh, maps together. Well, the LiDAR system came and created this computer model that facilitated their emergency services in, in an incredible fashion. So let's talk a little about building information modeling. That's another revolutionary technology that's, that's hitting the, the engineering and architectural community. Now I know a lot of people have the impression that building information technology, that the building in that term stands for like this, a structure, a building. Well, from a civil engineer's perspective, which is what I am, the, the, uh, uh, the building in, in BIM is a verb. It's about construction. It's about building something. Because that's what thing that, that, the, uh, that BIM does. It allows you to virtually construct within a computer model any project, be it a building, be it a utility, be it, be it water system, sewer system, street, bridge, whatever. You build it in a 3D model and you do it in a, such a fashion that you can, you can sequence through the construction process and identify problems while it's still in the computer form before you have costly equipment on the, on the ground. So uh, uh, states have recognized a value in building information modeling, so much so that Wisconsin in 2009 uh, legislature said, okay, anything over five million uh, uh, in construction costs is gonna be run through a BIM. Texas had a similar legislation about a year later. So why use BIM? It's more than just a 3D model. It, it reduces, it's been proven to reduce requests for information in the field by more than 50%. So here's a, a, a 3D model of a bridge for construction. You can see all of the uh, potential clash detections. Now, terminology in, in GIS, you often talk about uh, proximity analysis and what's near each other. Same thing in BIM, it's just a different term, it's clash detection. When does one utility run into another? So that is the same type of algorithm. In BIM, you're talking about 3D models of objects uh, versus, versus the, uh, the map type data you have in a, in a uh, proximity analysis. More than just a 3D model, you link BIM to a construction schedule, you associate BIM to construction costs, that's where you might consider the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension of BIM. And it's great for visualizing what will be built and the sequence of that construction. It really helps the various construction trades understand their part of the project in a better fashion. So what's next? I think change is accelerating. I think revolutionary changes are coming. I showed 3D models of bridge, that's nothing. There's gonna be 3D models of entire communities. Social networks are in their infancy and they're gonna have a profound impact on our industry. Continuous pervasive monitoring is here. Enormous, it generates enormous amounts of data that's processed in real time and made available to you on your cell phone. Search-based software applications, we'll talk a little bit about that, are, uh, are, are up and coming as well as crowdsourced applications. So social media, you know, you, you've got sort of a diagram here that it comes at you from all different directions and uh, consider every smartphone is a geospatially aware measurement device and that the tweets and the comments and the blogs are all in a computerized form that can be easily analyzed en masse. I've heard it said that the FBI considers Facebook the very best spy engine ever invented. 
social media for government. So, you know, the, the government agencies, I believe, so far, and I'd love to talk to you about this in some of the intermissions, if, if there's anybody that's doing anything, but I, I think they're a little afraid of social media, and I would suggest to maybe change that, because social media is a means of communication that is very effective in times of crisis. And need, the, social media isn't something that you just send an email blast out to. It doesn't work that way. You have to be an established voice of authority for people to see your messages. And so by engaging in social media conversations and putting into the public your projects that are, are influencing citizens and having established yourself as a voice of authority in a social media setting will only provide an enormous benefit when a time of crime is crisis comes by. Crowdsourcing, the idea is that every, uh, every phone is a measurement device that, that can provide information and so there's apps that you can put on phones and so for example imagine having a phone that can because there's g-force measurements in phones you put the phone on your car and you're driving down the street and anytime a, a, a pothole gets hit that phone can send your GPS coordinate to the Public Works Department that's an example of crowdsourcing of being able another one is is a uh, lady on the bench there says I don't get good broadband coverage here I'm gonna use this app and this was actually an app that sold a, a million units in, in the Utah area report to the government that this is a location I'd like to get broadband but I can't to help facilitate where cell tower towers might be uh, placed software applications in a traditional sense are quite rigid they're built on structured data data resources typically heavily one-shot development. You know, you've got inflexible data requirements, you've got a complex user interface, and a lot of training. Software of the future, much of it will be based upon the connected to web-based sources of information. Information that's not structured, it's unstructured data. It'll be coupled with a dynamic contextual navigation, sort of a web-based interface, things that everybody knows how to use their browser, so search is, is becoming the key element to many new applications. And the application for searching and analyzing data that's unstructured, those applications will evolve as the data gets updated. So as a new crisis occurs and people are tweeting about it, it becomes available to a, a search-based application. So imagine that in law enforcement. What would happen if, if, crime, if all your crime data was geocoded and an officer out in the field had a, had a heads-up display device and data was not, he didn't ask for data, it was pushed to him. This heads-up display knows where he is, it knows all of the recent incidents that have been re reported in that area, all the history of every address that he's looking at, and he can just have on his heads-up display and look around and see the information he might put in a contextual search saying, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this type of crime right now, What's, what am I looking at? So geospatial intelligence, it's, it's creating collective understanding, abstracting our world into knowledge objects that we consider data, imagery, maps. These are persistent in these kinds of applications. Intelligence integrates the information from many sources, evolving with the new measurement technologies. The phone's just one example. Geospatially aware networks are becoming available. These are enabling social networks to emerge. So, again, in the social networks, it knows where you are. Connectivity in real time makes real time data possible to analyze by the cloud based systems. This makes GIS available to everyone. Source data can come from anywhere. It's available through lightweight mobile devices. It's easily accessible to all information. I would say the geospatial revolution is here. I'd like to end with a quote from, a, from a, uh, uh, someone we all know, and I've got a lot of great respect for this, this gentleman. He's done an enormous contribution to uh, the geospatial industry. So GIS will connect you the GIS professional, with knowledge workers, with managers, with policymakers and citizens. It will extend your reach 
It will also empower them to participate in the same network environment, the same shared infrastructure, the same common services, creating shared understanding. I would say that this is a great evidence that GIS is here to improve judgment and decision making in our public works arena. Be glad to address any questions.